Hi there. Uh, this will be the second video lecture for our course in social inequality, um, where we'll be looking at sociological theories of class, status, and uh, other factors that are relevant to the study of social inequality. So I'm going to go to the screen share here now and pull up our PowerPoint for this week. Um, the theory is a really important part of sociology. Uh, it's really an important element of this discipline um, because theories, the, the role of theory is basically to ask these big questions about society, about how it works, about why things are the way they are, about how things got to be the way they are. Sociological theory's role is basically to ask these big questions about society that then as sociologists, we go out and we try to, to study and research um, and do you know empirical studies where we collect data and evaluate evidence and try to evaluate you know, the degree to which these theories are correct. Um, over on the right side in the little cartoon there, you have some examples of um, like theoretical paradigms that are often invoked in sociology, kind of no matter what the subject is, whether it's about education or policy or culture. Um, there's conflict theory, there's functional analysis or functionalist theory and symbolic interactionism are sort of seen as the three, you know, theoretical paradigms from which you can view any number of like issues or problems in sociology. Um, what we're gonna look at it today mostly has to do with um, what's known as conflict theory. Uh, the conflicts between groups fighting over resources, um, because that's really at the heart of what social inequality is. And so when we're looking uh, today, we'll be looking at classical and contemporary theories of class status and forms of capital. Um, from the sort of classical tradition, we'll be looking at the ideas of Karl Marx and Max Weber, um, who are generally considered to be uh, the, the among the titans of sociological uh, theory, um, very influential theorists uh, who have a, a lot to say about these kinds of conflicts over resources and, and inequality. So when we look at Karl Marx, we'll be looking at his ideas about class and class struggle. Uh, when we look at Max Weber, we'll be looking at um, his definition of class, which sort of differs from Marx's, and then his category of what he calls status. Um, representing more contemporary strains of sociological theory, we have Pierre Bourdieu, a French sociologist uh, who looked at forms of what he called capital um, and the way that people use different forms of capital in everyday life to advance their interests. And then uh, finally, we'll be kind of wrapping things up by uh, introducing the framework of intersectionality, which looks at how forms of inequality and oppression that are related to uh, class, but also to race and gender, um, how those forms of inequality, oppression and power intersect with one another um, in what's sometimes called a matrix of domination or a matrix of oppression in which uh, class, race, and gender all you know intersect within people's lives and within the different structures of inequality throughout our, uh, our institutions and our society. So we'll be kind of like previewing the intersectional perspective uh, because we go into more depth in, uh, on intersectionality when we look at actual problems and inequalities related to race, gender, and class, like the racial wealth gap, which we'll be looking at in week four, or um, the criminalization of black girls in schools, um, or at the conditions of migrant farm workers. Those are all things in which will be uh, problems or topics in which we'll be deploying a, 
intersectional approach to make sense of multiple forms of oppression and inequality and power. So we start with Karl Marx, um, who is, you know, as I said, generally considered to be one of the founding figures of sociological theory um, and who carries an enormous amount of influence to this day because of his analysis of capitalism. Uh, Marx is generally known, of course, as the, the father of modern communism. Uh, but the fact of the matter is, is that Marx spent most of his life analyzing and writing about and researching the history of capitalism uh, as a system. And uh, obviously, given the fact that we live in the most capitalist society in the history of the world right now in the United States in 2023, uh, Karl Marx's ideas continue to be very relevant uh, and in, in many cases are kind of having a, a bit of a comeback um, after they were pronounced dead in the you know 1990s with the end of communism in uh, Russia and Eastern Europe. Uh, now Marx's ideas are you know um, having a bit of a, a, a moment, a comeback because, uh, not so much about what he had to say about communism, but because of what he had to say about capitalism. So in these slides, we're going to sort of present some of Marx's ideas about class, his theory of how the working class is exploited under capitalism. Uh, I don't pretend to be presenting an exhaustive, complete survey of his ideas. This is not a complete explanation of his sociological theories. Um, but rather one that's just relevant to the specific thing that we're looking at in this class right now, which is um, class and class struggle. So Marx's notion of, of class uh, is going to be especially important, though, for mm -hmm. explaining the main takeaway from the first lecture, from last week's lecture, which was about the increase of social inequality since the 1970s. Um, how, you know, after uh, decades in which things actually became more equal after World War II, uh, since the 1970s, the last 50 years or so, we've seen a real increase in all measures of inequality uh, in, in terms of wealth and income and, and those measures that were talked about in the first class. Um, from a Marxist perspective, we might see this as a kind of class struggle, a continuation of the class struggle, um, only a class struggle in which like the wealthy are winning, um, in which the owners of capital, the bourgeoisie, uh, have been winning in a war against working people in which they've been squeezing the working class. Um, this is what is the subtitle of the text that you're reading, uh, the Age of Inequality, uh, the subtitle of it is Corporate America's War on Working People. Well, that kind of um, suggests that there's a kind of a class struggle kind of approach in the way that they see how inequality, why inequality has increased so dramatically in the last half century or so. So Marx and Engels uh, in the Communist Manifesto, the, the very first opening line of the first part of the Communi Communist Manifesto, Marx and Engels assert that the history of all hitherto existing society is the history of class struggles. And the reason that this is a really sort of bold proclamation, a bold announcement, um, is be that it sort of lays down what they call a materialist conception of history that was presented to be a, a, an alternative to the dominant way of seeing history, which would have been kind of idealistic. The idealistic way of seeing history was that history was uh, driven by great ideas, uh, by democracy, by science, by reason. Um, the idealistic theory, uh, the dominant way of thinking was that, you know, these were the things that made society and history go round was the advance of great ideas. And Marx and Engels here are saying that no, it is in fact 
these more concrete material struggles over resources, uh, over land, over wealth, uh, over what they call the means of production, that those are the struggles that have driven uh, history forward, uh, the motor of, of historical change, if you will, as opposed to ideas, culture, and values. And they go on then to say that basically this class struggle has taken a number of different forms throughout history. As they write, you know, freeman and slave, patrician and plebeian, lord and serf, guild master and journeyman. In a word, oppressor and oppressed stood in con constant opposition to one another. So this class struggle has taken a number of different forms throughout history, um, you know, depending on sort of the economic relations uh, at a given time and a given place. But basically it boils down to this struggle between, as they say, between oppressor and oppressed. Uh, throughout history, or at least throughout written history, there has been this long, you know, ongoing struggle uh, in which uh, different classes have been pitted against one another. Uh, so what's being sort of outlined here is, is kind of a class theory of society in which all societies past and present have been divided uh, in over control and ownership of what they call the means of production of land, tools, resources, infrastructure, uh, anything else that is required for production. Now, Marx and Engels are um, later, uh, when they started doing research into sort of more kind of pre-historic societies, they began to recognize that, you know, originally there were these stages of what they called primitive communism, in which people lived, you know, before uh, basically like private property, people were able to live in a more kind of egalitarian uh, communal kind of way. Um, but with the introduction of private property um, and uh, private ownership of the means of production, class becomes, uh, class becomes this, this central divide within societies uh, across history. So they do recognize that there was this kind of this moment before uh, class was something that divided human beings um, in terms of property and access to the means of production. Um, but since the introduction of private property and um, a division over the means of production, we've had these kind of class divisions so simply put, class societies are those that are divided between those who own the means of production and those who do not own the means of production and therefore must labor. So it's basically a division between the owners and the workers um, that has taken different forms throughout history. And the idea of this class theory of society is that the ruling class has been able the owning class has been able to use its power to dominate political and cultural institutions, especially the state, the, the government, or you know, whatever kind of um, uh, military and political force has been used to maintain social order in societies. Uh, the, whoever owns the means of production has been able to wield power over that uh, state, uh, over that governing body. And this also includes um, the sphere of what they call ideology. The idea that the, the ideas of the ruling class are in every epoch, the ruling ideas. So that those with the power and the wealth and the ownership of the means of production are also able to dominate the sphere of ideas. Um, and so, you know, for Marx and Engels, they look historically at things like religion um, as forms of ideology in which those with the power and the wealth have been able to use ideas uh, 
to uh, control the uh, oppressed and keep the oppressed in line and to dominate um, the kind of ideas that are in circulation throughout society. So the way that they put this is that the class, which is the ruling material force of society, is at the same time its ruling intellectual force. Nonetheless, uh, throughout history, we see this dynamic of resistance and revolt uh, in which the oppressed classes um, mobilize, they resist, they fight back. And so from Marx's Engels, uh, Marx and Engels' standpoint, history has been a history of these class struggles. And class struggles have been the thing that have moved societies forward. Uh, they've been the, the motor of, of social change and social progress, whether it was the revolt of slaves or the revolts of uh, serfs or peasants, uh, or in modern times, the revolt of the working class of the, of the proletariat. They believe that, you know, throughout history, we see this constant struggle, um, and that that is the, the engine of change and, and progress throughout history. Now, um, under capitalism, the most modern form of economic production that was coming into being in Marx and Engels' time and is, is, is very, you know, obviously dominant in our time around the world, um, in the capitalist society, the class structure becomes increasingly polarized, uh, meaning that the intermediate classes, the middle classes, you know, tend to kind of fade away and society polarizes into uh, these, into this, this opposition, this division between, if you will, the haves and the have nots, uh, between the owners and the workers. As they put it in the Communist Manifesto, society as a whole is more and more splitting up into two great hostile camps, into two great classes directly facing each other, the bourgeoisie and the proletariat. You know, so the bourgeoisie being the owning class, the proletariat being the working class, um, or you know, if you prefer the language of like Occupy Wall Street. Uh, Occupy Wall Street talked about the division between the one percent and the ninety-nine percent. Uh, I referenced this in the in the previous lecture. The one percent referring to the, those who own, you know, like thirty-five or forty percent of the nation's wealth, and the ninety-nine percent who are, you know, um, in some degree or another, sort of struggling to get by. The intermediate classes then. The artisans and craftsmen, the small business owners, the, the independent farmers tend to be kind of pushed into the ranks of the proletariat, to be proletarianized, uh, to lose their small business, to lose their uh, craft, and to be pushed into the ranks of being wage workers. Um, historically, Marx and Engels say that this is the way that the capitalism uh, works is to put the intermediate classes into the 99%. Um, the way that they define this proletariat is as a class of laborers who live only so long as they find work and who find work only so long as their labor increases capital. So that, uh, again, a class of people whose survival depends upon their ability to find work, to be employed, to get a job. Um, and that their ability to get a job, to find work, depends on whether they can make capital richer, uh, um, whether you can provide the labor that will increase somebody else's capital, your boss's capital. If you can't increase uh, the capital of your employer, they have no reason to hire you. Uh, that is the only reason 
that an employer is going to uh, hire labor is if they think that they can further increase the value of their capital. Otherwise, what's the point? Um, so they believe that, that there's this kind of proletarianization that happens, this, 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 this splitting um, of the intermediate classes and pushing the middle classes into towards the ranks of the proletariat. Um, now, when Marx looked at actual class struggles that were taking place in his time, like say in France during the 1840s, he recognized that you know it, it was a, still a more complex situation. It wasn't just like two classes fighting it out. There was still the historical remnants, the, the residue of these previous classes like the aristocracy and the peasantry that continued to play a role in these class struggles. But you know, still nonetheless, the, the tendency was towards uh, one of polarization. So now, how does this process of um, exploitation specifically work under capitalism? I've kind of begun to hint that there's this process of exploitation that's kind of like baked into the cake of how capitalism works. According to Marx, uh, in a capitalist society, the owners of capital, the people who are the bourgeoisie, profit from the exploitation of the working class, the proletariat. So that there's this fundamental uh, process of exploitation that is like built into the system. Um, the way that people in you know Occupy Wall Street would have put it was that um, the the system isn't broken; it's fixed. It, it's not, uh, in other words, it's not unjust or unequal because there's something wrong with it. There's something, uh, the system is unjust and unequal because that's what it's designed to do, um, because it's fixed, uh, because that's the, it's a rigged system, if you will. And the nature of that rigged, you know, uh, system is, is that capital extracts more value from workers than what it pays them in wages in the most simplest kind of term, uh, sense of the term, there is a surplus value that is extracted from workers. That basically like, in other words, workers are paid less in wages than the value of what they produce at work, the commodities that they produce at work. And capital profits from this surplus value, this, this extra thing that's above and beyond what is paid to workers in their wages. So that capital is constantly taking this kind of this extra, this surplus and absorbing it and using it to get wealthier and wealthier and wealthier in a way that Marx compares to a vampire. You know, a vampire is basically like feeding off the blood of the working class. Um, in a like almost like a in a like a parasite kind of way I mean in which like others are doing the work and uh, capital is kind of feeding off of this uh, labor that's being done by the working class as a whole and so this is why he compares uh, capital to a vampire um, in uh, volume one of Das Kapital he says a uh, capital is dead labor that vampire like only lives by sucking living labor and the more and lives the more the more labor it sucks so there's this kind of fundamentally parasitical relationship um, in which capital is getting wealthy by expropriating this surplus this extra that uh that workers are producing um, above and beyond what they're being paid in terms of wages. And so workers are kind of fundamentally getting screwed uh, because they're only receiving a fraction of the value of the commodities that they produce at work. To explain this in a little bit more complicated terms or in, in terms that are more consistent, you know, with the, the categories that Marx himself used. 
um, the labor theory of value in the labor theory of value, the value of any commodity is determined by the amount of socially necessary labor time that is needed to produce it. Uh, the labor theory of value was something that Marx, uh, it was a set of ideas that Marx inherited from other economists like uh, Adam Smith and, and David Ricardo. And then he kind of put his own spin on it, a more critical kind of spin on the labor theory of value. So, but basically the labor theory of value deter says that, you know, any, the value of any commodity is basically per is determined by the amount of time that's needed to produce it. Um, the amount of socially necessary labor time. And this, uh, the value of this commodity, of, of any commodity includes um, the capacity for labor that workers sell to capital. Um, so when we go out on the job market, we are selling a commodity that Marx calls our labor power, which is basically like our promise to work for the employer. We're out there selling you know, a promise that we're going to sign away in a contract or, you know, maybe just a handshake or some agreement in which we promise to work for the employer for a certain amount of time in return for a certain wage. Um, and uh, the value of that labor power, uh, the value of that commodity that we as workers sell is like every other commodity determined by the amount of time that's needed to produce it. Uh, in this case, the value of the labor power is thus determined by the cost that is required for maintaining the worker as a worker and developing him or her uh, or them uh, into a worker. So that basically like the amount of you know, education and training and, you know, what it costs for us to, you know, have food and a, a shelter and, you know, the basic things that we need to live so that we can get up and go to work the next day. So the value of what we do as workers, uh, as, you know, in terms of our labor power is determined by what it costs to reproduce our existence, to make us, uh, to, to maintain us as workers and to develop us into workers. So that includes things like training and education. So the wages that are paid to uh, us as workers represent the value of our labor power. And so Marx basically says, assuming an equilibrium of supply and demand, assuming that supply and demand are constant, Wages are determined by the value of a worker's labor power, the cost of keeping us alive and able to work, including education, training, and so on and so forth. So all things being equal, workers will be paid according to this minimal standard of living. In other words, that employers will basically just kind of pay us as little as they can get away with so that we're still able to kind of get up and function and go to work the next day. Um, that sometimes we call like, you know, a, a standard of living or a, a living wage, you know, this kind of minimal um, threshold, this uh, of what's necessary to reproduce the worker as a worker. Um, that's what the value of labor power is and that's uh, the sort of the standard, the base standard, according to which wages will be paid. But Marx met, argues that labor power is, a, in another sense, a unique commodity, unlike any other commodity, because what labor power, what the power of human labor can do is to create more value than what is necessary to reproduce it. In other words, that workers are able to create this thing that Marx calls surplus value, that we create uh, or are capable of creating commodities that are more valuable than labor power itself. And this is where the sort of the, the exploitation comes in, the expropriation of this extra thing that workers create 
that then is absorbed by capital. So capital kind of pays workers only uh, the minimum of what it needs, it can get away with, but it extracts an extra surplus. And that surplus is the source of profit. And what capital does then is then to take those profits and to reinvest, you know, a portion of them. Um, you know, some of those profits will be used on, you know, luxury goods like yachts and so forth. But some of them will also be reinvested into hiring more workers and, you know, introducing more machinery or uh, purchasing other raw materials. But there will be a sort of a cycle of capital accumulation. Uh, and the way that Marx sort of pictures this is that capital grows and grows and grows uh, while workers are stuck on this kind of like hamster like treadmill uh, in which we're kind of like just struggling just to stay in the same place um, just to survive put food on the table pay rent keep the lights on and so forth so capital becomes wealthier and wealthier and wealthier and more powerful while workers are stuck on this uh, treadmill. So there is a uh, fundamentally unequal relationship that is built into this system. Um, the way that Marx depicts it is where labor and capital are interdependent yet antagonistic. It's like they're locked in a bad relationship um, in which each side is kind of dependent on the other, and yet they have fundamentally opposing interests, uh, fundamentally antagonistic relationships. So they're kind of like locked into a bad relationship. Um, this, is a, this is, you know, the way of seeing the world that Marx inherits from the philosopher Hegel. Uh, a dialectical way of seeing the world as a as a unity of opposites, uh, like two um, poles of a battery, you know, a, a positive and a negative charge in a battery that are sort of locked into one thing together, but are in uh, fundamental antagonism. And so he says that basically like the interests of the capitalist class and the working, the interests of the working class are intrinsically related to one another, but also inherently antagonistic, interconnected, yet in perpetual conflict. So on the one side, workers are dependent on capital in the sense that we need capital to hire us. Uh, we need to sell our labor power to capital so that we can get a wage to buy the things that we need to live to survive. Um, so as workers, we are in a relationship of dependence. Um, on the other side, in order to profit, capital also needs labor. Uh, capital has to hire workers in order to produce more value to to produce this surplus value, this extra value that is greater than what they are paid in wages. So both sides kind of need each other, but also have these fundamentally antagonistic relations, uh, interests. So workers want higher wages. They want better working conditions. They want shorter working hours. As long as there have been wage workers, there this has been what has been in the interests of wage workers. They want a higher standard of living, a better way of life, um, and basically to spend less time at work. And conversely, employers have a fundamental interest, a built-in interest, in wanting to keep wages as low as possible um, and to keep working hours as long as possible in order for them to be able to maximize profits. So there's this like perpetual tug of war. Um, no matter how you know nice or good uh, people are on either sides of this tug of war, uh, 
the fact remains that they have that these two groups have fundamentally antagonistic relationship to one another. They, they have uh, opposing interests that are that are built in. For workers, um, the way that they're historically and all the way up to the present, uh, to, up to the present day, the way that workers have been able to gain power within this relationship is when they are able to bargain collectively um, as a union, you know, as, you know, some way in which like workers are able to take uh, collective action. Uh, and the sort of like the the, the great uh, card that they have to play, um, the, the, the most uh, valuable weapon that the working class has in this struggle is the ability to go on strike or withhold their labor in some way. That historically, since Marx's time all the way up to the present, that has been the main way in which workers have been able to bargain for higher wages, better working conditions, shorter hours, all the things that workers want, you know, in order to make their lives better. Um, the main weapon that has been used that workers have at their disposal are work stoppages, you know, to withhold labor. In those moments, capital's dependence on labor is exposed in those struggles. That if workers aren't working, capital's not profiting. You know, if if workers withhold their labor, nothing nothing happens because it's workers that make the world go round. So capital has a number of ways in which then it can try to maximize its profits and, you know, in this vampire like way can, you know, extract more blood out of the working class. Um, and again, Marx noticed these uh, strategies in the 19th century and they're, they're still very much at play today. Um, so obviously one way that they can, the capital can extract more surplus value is to try to keep wages as low as possible so they can extract an even greater amount of surplus out of their workers. Um, but in addition to that, Marx saw that capital had other strategies for maximizing the surplus value extracted from the working class. This includes um, increasing what Marx called the absolute surplus value by basically lengthening the working day. Um, you just basically have workers work, you know, longer hours so that you can extract more surplus out, out of them. Um, but there's a limit to how much you can do. I mean, there's only so many hours in the day. And also, like, if you overwork your employee, your employees, um, they're going to become like less productive, you know, if they don't get enough sleep or they're physically exhausted or mentally exhausted. You know, you can only work your workers so much. There are natural limits to this. But the other strategy Marx noted, which was in some ways more of a kind of an ingenious strategy and the one that we still see to this day, was to increase relative surplus value. And the way that that is done is through technical innovations in production, which effectively reduce the value of labor power. Uh, so this is basically involves like automation and uh, other ways of like technically like reorganizing the workplace to increase productivity. Um, and this increasing productivity basically lowers the value of labor power, lowers the amount of time that's ne necessary to reproduce a, uh, a worker's existence, and so therefore maximizes the amount of surplus value that can be extracted. So that constant quest for relative surplus value has been especially important throughout the history of capitalism. It's basically the introduction of more and more machinery and automation uh, and technological um, developments to replace 
human labor. Um, above all, it drives capitalists to invest in technologies to replace human labor. And that is something that, you know, to this very day, we are seeing with, you know, artificial intelligence um, and, uh, you know, all kinds of technologies that came before uh, with, uh, you know, with computers and digitalization and those kinds of technologies that have replaced, you know, so many jobs that used to be done by human beings. And so with that, you know, uh, automation of human labor comes a kind of a disempowering of the working class and a reduction of the value of labor power. Uh, the irony of this, of course, is that, though, is that, that, that workers are the source of capital's profits. And so as you rely less and less on human beings, it creates uh, what Marx called a declining rate of profit. Um, but uh, I don't have, really have the time to sort of go into that, but it's um, one of the ways in which capital, uh, Marx believes that capital um, kind of like undermines its own interests in the long term. So sp speaking of which, like Ma Marx's dialectical understanding of, of history led him to believe that in a number of different ways, uh, one of which I just mentioned with the declining rate of profit, that capital would unwittingly plant the seeds of its own destruction. The capital was not only destructive of people's lives and of workers' lives and, and of the planet, but it was also like kind of self-destructive, that it would create its own crises, um, that it was fundamentally an unsustainable system that was prone to, to crisis and even breakdown. And um, as Marx and Engels put it in the Communist Manifesto, uh, they said, you know, what the bourgeoisie therefore produces above all are its own grave diggers. That it will unconsciously, unintentionally create the very conditions for its own self-destruction. And that the grave diggers who would basically bury the bourgeoisie would be the proletariat, that it would be the working class, the 99% that would rise up uh, and destroy capital um, in a moment of crisis in which capital had already planted the seeds of its own destruction. So the idea is that capital not only exploits labor, but also unintentionally furnishes them with the weapons of revolution. And these are talked about, um, again, in the Manifesto of the Communist Party, they talk about how workers become, uh, you know, great numbers of exploited workers are, are concentrated in, in huge cities and factories and, and offices, and that this creates a kind of like social dynamite, you know, it creates a, an explosive um, condition for strikes and riots and demonstrations and you know ultimately revolutions uh, that allows workers to organize more easily because now instead of being spread out across the countryside they are concentrated together in cities and factories and offices um, capital also supplies these new technologies for communication and transportation that allow you know, workers to communicate and organize and, and unite um, even across borders, you know, even across nations, uh, as they say in the, in the slogan that ends the Communist Manifesto, workers of the world unite. They imagine that there's, for the first time in history, there's this possibility for like international solidarity for, for workers to unite across borders and um, the irony is, is that it's capital that's going to create and provide those instruments, those technologies of communication and transportation that make that kind of international solidarity possible. And so I talk about this uh, in the manifesto 
and uh, there's some you know sort of passages to sort of look into that. But the the idea of the, is that there's this kind of ironic force of history in which capital creates the conditions ultimately for its own demise and for the rise of what um, Marx and Engels term as a as communism as the rise of a classless society where classless uh, social classes have been abolished once and for all. This will be kind of a, a return to what we talked about earlier of um, a primitive form of communism that existed before private property, um, but it would not just simply be a return to those conditions, but also an advance upon them in which the forces of production, the forms of technological development and all of the um, the things that that had been built up through capitalism would be um, preserved and maintained only they would now be used to service human needs in general and not just the needs of like the one percent so <clears throat> that you know it, it kind of encapsulates what Marx's vision was um, leading up through, you know, the end of the 19th century. And it became a very influential idea um, even after, um, but especially after Marx died in 1883 and was gaining a lot of um, steam, the, the Marxist vision of the world uh, through the 1890s and early 1900s when this next social theorist who we uh, speak of often in sociology, uh, when uh, this, this man named Max Weber was sort of coming about, he was having to kind of reckon with the influence and popularity of Marxist ideas. And so he, he took some of the ideas that Weber took were from Marx and Marxism, but he also kind of, um, went in his own direction and and uh, put his own kind of unique spin on some of these uh, categories and and topics and issues. Um, so, like Karl Marx, Max Weber is considered to be like a founding figure in the history of sociology and sociological theory. Um, somebody who wrote very widely about economics, religion, and politics in different societies around the world throughout various historical epochs. Um, he was, if if nothing else, Max Weber was uh, somebody with a, a, a great understanding of world history um, and the role that religion and economics and politics had, had played in world history. Um, we now refer to this uh, as a kind of comparative historical sociology in which Max Weber was basically comparing different societies and different cultures and different religions um, throughout world history. So um, his ideas, again, they his sort of dovetail with Marx's, um, but then kind of go in their own direction. The, what we're going to be looking at in for purposes of this class is his essay um, on power, which in which he refers to class status and party, um, which examines uh, the concepts of uh, social class and status. Those will be the, the main forms of power that we'll talk about here today that are especially relevant for the study of inequality. So in this essay, the full title of it is The Distribution of Power Within the Political Community, Class, Status, and Party. <clears throat> um, Weber kind of outlines his way of seeing the world, which um, you know, we spoke of earlier as, as, a, as a kind of conflict theory. Um, Weber um, is like Marx in the general sense that he thinks that the conflict is really the thing that makes the world go around. Um, that conflict is really endemic to social life. So he saw society in terms of conflicts between groups that were divided by forms of economic, political, and cultural stratification. Uh, stratification referring to a kind of like a hierarchy or a, 
uh, you know, uh, an inequality of resources and access to resources. Uh, Weber's definition of power he lays out in the beginning of this essay as the chance of a man or a number of men to realize their own will in a social action against the resistance of others who are participating in the action. It's, it's the last part of this sentence that's really key. It's like the, the idea is that you have power when you're able to get other people to do what you want them to do, even if they resist. You know, even when others resist, uh, you're able to basically exercise uh, your will either as an individual or as a group um, over an individual or a group within society. When it comes, so Weber basically starts this essay by saying, this is my theory of power. And now we're going to look at how power is kind of played out or you know, is is gained and lost through these different forms of of class status, and then uh, finally political party. Um, we'll just look at class and status for the purposes of this um, course. So when we look at class, he basically gives us an economic definition. It's it's different from Marx's. Marx's definition of class emphasizes, you know, whether you're um, kind of like an owner or a worker. Um, for Marx, that's the definition of class. Weber's definition of class is a little bit more uh, elaborate. <clears throat> he says that the class is, first of all, a number of people uh, who have in common a uh, causal component of their life chances. Um, life chances meaning like kind of like the chances that you have to succeed, uh, the opportunities that you have in life that come from your position within uh, an economic social system um, and then the life chances that like you can pass down to your kids you know the opportunities that you that the next generation has as a result of the you know the opportunities or lack of opportunities that you may have uh, secondly this component is represented exclusively by economic interests in the possession of goods and opportunities for income. So Weber gives class, you know, a, a pretty specifically economic definition. Um, it's for him, not just about whether you are an owner or a worker, but has to do with uh, income and your possession of goods. And then um, finally, uh, the definition of class is represented under the condition of the commodity uh, or labor markets. So like Marx, he has a, a sort of an economic definition of class, but he kind of diverges from Marx in emphasizing these kinds of uh, market conditions and factors like income and uh, you know the possession of material goods. <clears throat> now, when he goes to talking about status, this is when um, Weber tries to most um, diverge from Marx the, the most. Um, Weber argued that the people do not simply strive for power um, simply in order to enrich themselves economically. Um, he thought that that was a little too uh, crude. Um, people don't just try for power because it makes them rich. They also kind of love power for its own sake, uh, that they um, are kind of motivated, um, uh, that power is kind of an independent thing that people strive for, not just a, a means towards material wealth. So the striving for power is, is motivated by, he says, a striving for social honor. Uh, social honor in the sense to be like recognized by others to for others to to validate uh, and look up to you um, the solely economic power of money is not always recognized as a basis for social honor so you now Weber is basically introducing the idea of you know that like power um, 
has to be seen in these social terms of recognition and honor, uh, like validation, um, but that that can't just simply be bought, um, that that's not just something that can be uh, monetarily purchased. And so this idea of status honor or the status order talks about the way that social honor is distributed among different groups within a community. And again, it's, it's kind of like, you know, money is a big part of it, but money is not the only part of it. Um, that that money and status are related, but still uh, autonomous or, um, you know, uh, independent from one another. So the status order and the status honor aren't simply something that are reducible to the class situation. They can't simply be bought. Um, and Weber says they often stand in sheer opposition to the pretensions of sheer property. And I think what Weber is doing here is basically he's introducing the, you know, the difference between like the aristocracy and the bourgeoisie. The bourgeoisie are the people that are obviously, you know, the capitalists who are motivated by money. Um, you know, they, they go to bed at night and wake up in the morning thinking about how to make money. But the aristocracy was sort of a, a ruling class, you know, before capitalism that was, you know, they, they were certainly wealthy and they had land and they had resources. But Weber is saying that they were kind of motivated a bit more by this thing called honor. And for the aristocracy, um, they looked down upon the bourgeoisie as being kind of like a little too focused on money, um, too like crude or too vulgar, um, too materialistic. And that distinction between the aristocracy and the bourgeoisie has, has continues to kind of carry over um, it, even into our times in the distinction that sometimes people make between old money and new money. You know, the idea that new money is a little bit like too uh, crude or vulgar about sh showing off their material possessions and, and flaunting their wealth. Whereas old money, you know, in, in a way that kind of goes back to the aristocracy, that, that old money is more... Um, uh, modest or humble or preserved or doesn't need to like show it off in the same kind of way. And so, you know, old money, you know, has historically looked down upon people like, you know, like Donald Trump, who, you know, has everything made out of gold. And you know, it's just like, is seen as like really vulgar and crude and so, you know, he might have a lot of money, but isn't necessarily, you know, invited to New York high society. You know, he's not necessarily like included in the, the social um, milieu of uh, the New York elite um, because people like him are seen as like a bit too um, crude in their, in their materialism. So what Weber is introducing here is this idea of status as something that's related to class, but not the same thing as class. And that it's used to describe these cultural subjective elements that are missing from the strictly objective definitions of class. So that status is kind of a matter of uh, more of a, a subjective category of like how people understand themselves and how they relate to um, the larger status order. It's not necessarily something you can just measure with like income or wealth. It's a kind of a more of like a cultural category. Um, <clears throat> Weber also talks about in this essay, uh, 
um, the extreme forms of um, like status hierarchy and uh, the reproduction of inequality as it is manifest in uh, caste systems um, and in forms of what he calls ethnic segregation. And here he says, you know, these distinctions are of status are ones that are enforced um, by social norms and laws and often by a religious sanction. And so stratification, the reproduction of, of hierarchy and inequality often takes its, its most extreme form when those differences are thought to be ethnic in nature. Um, that is to say that when they are thought to be products of nature rather than products of society and history. <laughs> when people begin to believe that like the differences and, and inequalities of society are the result of like biological differences, like uh, between, you know, different races or different ethnic groups or different religious groups. When people begin to, you know, uh, when these hierarchies of stratification are at their most extreme, um, the differences are understood to be um, uh, the result of nature and biology rather than society and history. So a caste system then is one where uh, ethnically segregated groups do not simply coexist in a horizontal system of cultural differences, but instead become part of a vertical system of domination and subordination. Weber argues that the caste system affects pariah peoples and can be found all over the world with Jews being the most prominent example uh, in world history. So this caste system has taken different forms uh, in different places throughout history. But the thing that sort of defines it is when the differences between groups are not just simply seen in like a horizontal way of cultural differences, but like a horizontal system of cultural differences would be like, you know, that different groups are like apples and oranges. Like they're different, but like not you know, one's not better than the other. They're just different. You know, that would be like a horizontal system of cultural differences in which it's like, oh, well, you know, there's this group over here and they have this language and they have this religion. And then there's this other group over here and they're, you know, they're equal, they're just different. That's not a caste system. When we have a caste system, we have a vertical system in which there are certain people on top and there are certain people on the bottom. And so those differences are a vertical system of do domination and subordination um, in which we have hierarchy and power and oppression. And so those caste systems, as Weber says, you know, are often enforced by social you know, norms and laws and religious sanctions. And the examples that he looks to are the persecution and oppression of Jews uh, in various places throughout Europe. Um, and uh, also, you know, we have this list here in the, um, in the, in the slide of different examples from India and Sri Lanka and Somalia and North Africa and Japan of different uh, caste systems. Um, certainly you, people have argued that the United States has had a caste system with regard to, uh, the Jim Crow, uh, system in the South, uh, racial, uh, segregation that, you know, was put in place, uh, at the end of slavery all the way up until the 1960s when the civil rights movement basically, you know, buried that Jim Crow system. Um, people argue that the United States continues to have a kind of racial caste system to this day uh, that has just taken different forms. 
Um, the common features of caste systems as it uh, lists here also in this uh, slide include, um, you know, so like endogamy, meaning like people marry within the group and it's kind of taboo if you marry outside of your group. Um, uh, the other common features of uh, profession, social status, uh, ex political exclusion of castes, and caste-based discrimination. These are features, you know, hallmarks, uh, characteristics of these caste systems that you find in various parts of the world. Um, now, turning to look at contemporary sociological theory, we're going to be looking at the ideas of Pierre Bourdieu, uh, who came, comes about later um, and was writing a lot in the 1960s and 70s and 80s and has a lot to say about um, issues that are relevant to the social reproduction of inequality. And he talks about the, the role that different forms of capital play in the reproduction of inequality. Um, so Bourdieu is, is, is a widely influential sociologist who conducted many empirical studies, uh, especially of like the school system, and is known for his theories of inequality and culture and what we've called social reproduction. Uh, social reproduction meaning kind of like, how do the ch children born into one class you know, end up, you know, being reproduced into that class as adults, you know, like how do working class kids get working class jobs? How do rich kids, you know, stay rich? Um, this question of social reproduction. Uh, the, the term capital, it's important to note, is very different. You know, Bourdieu uses it very differently than the way that Marx uses it. Marx talks about capital in terms of, you know, business and, and uh, you know, those who own the means of production. Um, Bourdieu talks about capital as something that's more like a personal asset, something that people have that they can use to advance their interests in society. It's, uh, you know, like a, a portfolio or a set of skills that we all have as individuals um, capital is the thing that we use in particular situations to try to advance our interests. And that's what how Bourdieu looks at it, uh, as opposed to the way that Marx looks at it. Um, and he, Bourdieu is especially important um, for sociological studies, uh, like I said, that, that strive to understand the reproduction of inequality, especially as it occurs in the school system. A lot of his research was looking at how schools reproduced class inequalities in France. You know, how the school system claimed to be like fair and equal for everybody. And yet systematically, you know, the kids from wealthier backgrounds uh, would be more successful and working class kids uh, not as successful within the school system. And so Bourdieu wanted to know how this was, like what it was about the school system that was reproducing inequalities, even though the school system itself thought of itself as like fair and equal and just. And so for this, he looked at um, cultural factors uh, like taste, language, uh, and what he called habitus as forces of social reproduction. So these are kind of the, the key terms that uh, Bourdieu uses, um, habitus, um, kind of the, the key part of habitus is habit, like it's a, a set of, he says, interpretive schema for practice. Um, you can think of it as like a, a toolbox or a, a set of skills that people um, have that comes to them through their, uh, as a result of their social class as, as a result of their upbringing, their background, their experience, their community, all of these shape our habitus as uh, people and in a way that's like kind of largely unconscious. Like we don't really have to think about it. Um, it comes naturally to us. It's just like 
the way that we act in a given situation. So it's our, you know, our language, our body posture, our way of communicating to people, our way of presenting ourselves, you know, our, our, you know, the way we dress and, and perform and, you know, act in a certain kind of situation. All of those things are products of society, but they're largely unconscious. Like we don't have to necessarily put a lot of thought into them. You know, they kind of almost come naturally to us. And Bourdieu's idea is that this habitus is both a product of the social structure. It's something that's, you know, produced by society, but it also plays a role in then reproducing the society and particularly like reproducing social inequalities. Now, where all of this action uh, takes place is in what Bourdieu calls fields. Um, fields like almost like a literally like a playing field in sports. Fields are the different like institutional spheres of the society. And they all kind of like are relatively autonomous in the sense that they all kind of have their own rules and their own like, you know, kind of rules to the game and rules to how to succeed and how to get ahead and and things like that. They're relatively autonomous in the sense that they're connected with one another. They overlap the different fields of society kind of overlap with one another, but they're all kind of also have some parts of them that make them distinct, that make them unique. And so, you know, academia, the arts, uh, schools, um, business, you know, these are all different sports. These are all examples of different fields in which people are, you know, trying to compete to maximize their interests to, you know, to get, you know, the, whether it's like fame or money or value or recognition or status, people are trying to um, win on the field. And the way that they try to maximize those interests, the way they try to win on the field is through the different kinds of capital that they have at their disposal. And Weber, uh, Bourdieu basically says that there are different kinds of capital out there in society that the kind of like uh, different like tools that people have at their disposal to try to win on the field. And uh, those forms of capital are like economic capital, uh, which, you know, basically comes down to money and wealth. Um, but there is also cultural capital, uh, which has more to do with knowledge and taste and credentials and, you know, the art of language and that sort of thing. And then finally, social capital, which kind of is like, kind of has to do with like who you know, uh, your social network, your social ties, and you know, people that you can call upon. Um, so this is talked a little bit more about uh, in a little bit more detail here. So economic capital uh, are the sort of like the material resources of wealth, land, money um, that one has at one's disposal that you can kind of use in a certain situation in order to advance your interests on the whatever field you're, you're playing on. Um, cultural capital are this kind of more non-material goods. They're not reducible to money, um, but they're more to do with educational credentials, types of knowledge and expertise, um, verbal skills, aesthetic preferences that can be converted into economic capital um, or, you know, in some other way can be used to advance one's interests uh, in the field of, in fields of society. Now, cultural capital <laughs> kind of goes back to what Weber was talking about with status. Like it's, you know, related to economic capital, but it's not the same thing. Um, so, you know, young people who have been raised in more privileged uh, backgrounds, uh, say, where like their um, parents were highly educated, are going to have not just more economic capital, but they're also going to have more cultural capital in terms of uh, verbal skills of, you know, language and, you know, having the ability to like, you know, spend a 
summer abroad in Europe or, you know, knowing about uh, art or literature or, you know, those kinds of like cultural tastes, you know, even like knowing which fork to use at the dinner party. Those are like forms of cultural capital that are like connected to money, but not necessarily like reducible to money. And then finally, there's social capital, you know, again, like sort of who you know, the, uh, you know, the, the networks of contacts and acquaintances that can be used to secure it or advance one's position. And again, this is like, you know, related to like family and background and community, you know, what kinds of people can uh, write letters of recommendation for you or you know who does your dad know you know uh, or like you know what kind of what people do you play golf with or you know those kinds of connections um, that uh, can translate into economic capital but um, aren't necessarily something that just can be simply bought so Bourdieu looks at this process of education and the reproduction of inequality in terms of how it plays out in the school system. Um, and he talks about like how, you know, the dominant classes, the different fractions of the uh, class system, um, people who have more economic capital or more cultural capital, how they're able to uh, make the the class their particular class culture becomes like the dominant culture. It becomes like the standard bearer of the culture. Whereas the culture of disempowered people, the culture of oppressed people um, is uh, marginalized or, you know, looked down upon. And these are things that don't necessarily like come out in like test scores. You know, these are is sometimes uh, embedded in what sociologists call like the hidden curriculum of education, like the, the unstated cultural assumptions that are embedded within the school system in ways that, you know, like educators and administrators don't even necessarily recognize. Um, another way of saying this is that there's like kind of a built-in cultural bias that's embedded within the institution of the school um, in a way that is uh, like not consciously recognized um, and yet it systematically favors the children of the more powerful and the wealthy and systematically uh, disempowers the children of the um, disempowered and oppressed. So it's social and cultural capital, um, not just wealth, but in addition to wealth, social and cultural capital that enables this reproduction of inequality. The, the kids with capital are able to get ahead and kids without capital are left behind. And again, Bourdieu offers this theory of education as a criticism as an alternative to the way that schools understand themselves. Um, the schools as institutions like to believe that they are institutions of meritocracy, where anybody can succeed based on their merits, uh, where people succeed or fail based on how hard they work, how hard they study, uh, their values, their, you know, their merit. Um, and as a society, we sort of have this idea that schools are like the great equalizer. They're supposed to be the great equalizer where everybody gets an equal chance. Everybody gets an equal opportunity. And so that that makes upward mobility possible, you know, that's able for like for, for, for a smart enterprising kid who grew up in a poor family for them to rise above um, and make it uh, into the upper classes. Um, that's sort of the narrative of the meritocracy. And, you know, that certainly there are like exceptional cases where that is true, uh, but it is not the norm. Um, it is not the, the standard. 
And so Bourdieu's research kind of is meant to expose these illusions of the meritocracy uh, and to show how, again, this institution is uh, like a, a, a rigged system. It's, it's not broken, it's fixed. Um, it's doing what it's meant to do, which is to reproduce social inequalities, to reproduce class privileges, uh, to reproduce unequal opportunities. He sort of, Bourdieu kind of expanded this um, analysis in a work uh, called Distinction. It's his most famous book um, in which he looked at like the art world and looked at a, a, a wider range of culture um, and cultural spheres of cultural taste. Um, he looked at everything from sports to food and wine um, to like leisure activities. Um, but, but, but with the same kind of idea that like culture and cultural taste are significant for the reproduction of domination and inequality, that they're crucial for social reproduction in ways that aren't necessarily recognized. And so again, as with the school system, we see one in which the dominant classes are able to impose their values, their standards, their tastes as being the legitimate ones, the socially recognized ones, while the culture of oppressed groups is seen as illegitimate, as marginal, as less than, as inadequate, um, and perhaps even pathological in some ways. And so Bourdieu kind of expanded his research here to conduct uh, surveys with French people of different social classes about their lifestyle, about consumption, about like how they decorate their homes, what kind of music they listen to, um, about art, about sports, about literature, about food and wine, home decor, leisure activities, Bourdieu was starting to understand that these forms of inequality in culture and, and habitus were spread throughout the society and manifest in all these different kinds of ways and drew this conclusion that proposed that people who have uh, cons uh, more cultural capital, people who have a lot of cultural capital, who have education and intellect and and verbal skills and styles of dress and all this kind of thing determine which aesthetic values constitute good taste. And conversely, the habitus created by social inequality renders people with little cultural capital, the social inferiors of the ruling class. So again, the, the role that culture plays in reproducing social inequality in a way that's very like um, not immediately evident. Uh, it's not immediately, you know, visible or apparent to people, the role that culture plays in reproducing power and privilege and inequality. So, you know, Bourdieu kind of draws this, um, diagram of you know various tastes it's an interesting little chart where he kind of divides um people into four different groups based on how much economic capital they have and how much cultural capital they have so there's some people that have a lot of um, economic capital and cultural capital but then there are some who have you know more economic capital uh and less cultural capital and uh, vice versa. And, and you notice like how he's, he's kind of put um, different like leisure activities or different tastes or different, you know, cultural preferences into these different like quadrants. Um, and he's also included like sort of political distinctions, which groups are more likely to vote for the right, which more likely to vote for the left. Um, and so, yeah, I mean, so there are some people like say who have 
um, more cultural capital, but less economic capital, like uh, artists or teachers, you know, people who are like well educated, but don't necessarily make, make a lot of money. And so they, you know, according to Bordeaux's research, they are more likely to, to enjoy hiking and um, going to the mountains. Uh, whereas, you know, those who have more economic capital, but less cultural capital like say they have a lot of money but not necessarily like a lot of like you know taste or education um they they might prefer things like you know hunting <laughs> and uh you know and this is more likely to be like commercial employers and industrialists as opposed to um artists and teachers so it's, it's an interesting kind of um sociological diagram here i always want somebody to do this for the united states you know for american society in uh the you know 21st century um Bourdieu did this for you know france in the 1970s so it looks a particular way but i, I imagine that you could do a similar kind of thing um for american society including you know politics and culture and that sort of thing um, finally, like we're, um, in, in this class in the, in the classes kind of going forward, um, we're going to be looking at not just, you know, at, at inequality in terms of class and status, but also in terms of, of race and gender and, and how these all kind of intersect with one another. And so we're just going to give just a little bit of a, of a preview of some of the intellectual theoretical approaches that we'll be taking in future weeks here um, as a as a an approach that's often known as uh, intersectionality which looks at sort of the overlaps and the um, you know the intersections if you will between race class and gender the idea is that you know social movements for racial and gender equality have raised significant sociological questions about how these inequalities intersect, the, the intersecting inequalities of, of race, class, and gender. And the theorists who adopt this approach are known as practitioners of intersectionality. Uh, probably the, the most like trailblazing work um, came out of this collective uh, a black uh, feminist lesbian organization that was active in Boston that called themselves the Combahee River Collective. Uh, they took their name from, uh, you know, the uh, an action by Harriet Tubman, who's you know running the Underground Railroad, and in the uh, region of, of South Carolina that you know freed more than 750 slaves and is the only military campaign in US history uh, planned and led by a woman uh so in their collective statement the Combahee River collective statement they state you know we find it difficult to separate race and class from sex oppression because in our lives they are most often experienced simultaneously so when we adopt an intersectional approach, we're going to be looking at how the forms of power and inequality that we've outlined here with regard to class uh, are at the same time at play with regard to race and gender, and how these all kind of are inseparable in the lives of the of people. Um, so this idea of intersectionality has been further developed um, into what's sometimes called a matrix of domination or a matrix of oppression, um, a, a sociological paradigm that explains how these issues of oppression involving race, class, gender, but also uh, nationality, ability, sexual orientation, how these all kind of come together in this kind of Venn diagram within people's lives, how these are interconnected and inseparable. And there's been a whole field of sociological research uh, and sociological theory that's been built upon these insights 
you know, since the 1970s and 80s, um, especially a woman named Patricia Hill Collins, uh, who is basically credited with uh, establishing this matrix of domination or matrix suppression uh, in her work called Black Feminist Thought, Knowledge, Consciousness, and the Power Politics of Empowerment, um, or the work of the legal scholar uh, Kimberly Crenshaw, uh, her work called Mapping the Margins, Intersectionality, Identity Politics, and Violence Against Women of Color. Um, these are seen now as real um, path-breaking, trailblazing works in developing an intersectional paradigm. Uh, there are many other works. I forgot to include Angela Davis's work called uh, Women, Race, and Class uh, is another important text uh, in the development of this approach. So um, an intersectional approach is one that we're going to be kind of taking in uh, future sections of the course, when we look, um, starting in week four, we look at the, the racial wealth gap, um, or when we look at migrant farm workers and uh, immigration policy, um, we look at the film um, about, uh, you know, farm workers in uh, the Central Valley in California and, and also in Florida. Uh -huh. And um, and then when we look at the issues with the school system in the, as far as looking at the criminalization of black girls in schools um, and looking at the documentary about that subject, uh, we'll kind of come back to some of Bourdieu's ideas about like culture and language and, you know, ask how we might, you know, add to Bourdieu's theories um, some ideas about uh, racial and, and gender inequalities to understand this this topic of the criminalization of black uh, girls in schools. So what hopefully we've done here with this class though is is to kind of lay a groundwork to set some issues and questions that we're going to be looking at as far as inequality and as far as the reproduction of inequality and then we can build on those in classes going forward. Um, starting with next week's class about uh, politics and economy uh, since the 1970s. Uh, so for that, I will bid you adieu and see you next time. Bye.